Hi, and welcome to today's presentation on restrictive cardiomyopathy. And so in restrictive cardiomyopathy, we say it is characterized by an increased stiffness of the heart muscles. And so the atria contracts against a stiff, non-dilated ventricles with a near normal systolic function. At least we find this in the early stages of the disease. So the problem here is that the ventricles finds it difficult to fill itself with blood and also to contract. The cause is mostly always uh, due to fibrosis or accumulation of some substances in the myocardium. Now, uh, restrictive cardiomyopathy is the least common of all the cardiomyopathies. Males are affected the same way as females. It's found mostly in developing countries and there is little uh, genetic uh, influence over here. Now, before we look at the etiology of restrictive cardiomyopathy, we must always pay attention to the past infiltrative disorders such as amyloidosis, sarcoidosis, or hemosiderosis and even radiation when we are taking history from our patients. Now, with the etiology of restrictive cardiomyopathy, we have the first one to be infiltrative disorders. Example is infiltration with, amyl with amyloid plagues uh, in hemosiderosis as well as in sarcoidosis. Now, if the heart muscles is infiltrated with amyloidosis or is infiltrated with amyloid plagues, we may find it in the heart muscles on histology. We may also find tons and tons of iron in the heart muscles when it is infiltrated with hemosiderosis. Then we may also uh, find infiltration with granuloma in sarcoidosis. Now, the most common of all of these, uh, uh, you know, infiltrative disorders in the UK is amyloidosis and in the US is sarcoidosis. And we may actually diagnose amyloid plagues on microscopy using the Congo red stain. The second major cause of restrictive cardiomyopathy is the endomyocardial fibroelastosis. And in this condition, there is thickening within the muscular lining of the heart chambers, usually due to an increase in the position of inelastic collagen fibers, hence their inability to stretch. We find this condition usually uh, in scleroderma where there is infiltration of collagen and also uh, in some glycogen storage diseases, as well as cancer metastasis and radiotherapy. And in radiotherapy, what happens is that there is direct physical damage to the myocardium. The remaining causes of restrictive cardiomyopathy is unknown or is idiopathic. Now, let's quickly go over the pathophysiology of restrictive cardiomyopathy. Now, we are going to use this diagram to explain. Now, as we've seen, there is stiffness or rigidity of the heart muscles. And so, and, and these stiffness or rigidity is usually caused by fibrosis or accumulation of substances. And so, with the accumulation of substances in the myocardium, the stiff or the stiffened heart leads to decreased elasticity of the myocardium as well as reduced compliance of the ventricles. So when you compare, when you look at these diagrams, this is the normal heart. As you can see, the walls are very nice, not hypertrophied, not dilated. The chambers are almost equal. And when you look at the one on the right, we find that there is some restriction of the walls of the left ventricle over here. And so it is unable to relax. Now, once there is reduced compliance of the ventricles, this will cause reduced diastolic filling time, meaning it takes very little time for the ventricles to fill itself with blood. And so it does not receive enough blood. What this means is that Less blood in, less blood out. 
which result in reduced amount of blood being pumped into circulation. What this also means is that the excess of blood will remain in the left atrium since the ventricles are stiff and can dilate, and this will cause atrial congestion due to the increased volume in its chambers and will lead to atrial enlargement with diastolic dysfunction, and eventually it will follow with systemic venous congestion. The systemic venous congestion will come because there is congestion in the lungs which will reflect back into the pulmonary artery then into the right ventricle which will also reflect the pressure back into the right atrium and so it's going to lead to congestion of fluid inside the, the venous system. And so once there is congestion inside the venous system, the fluid begins to move outside the vessels into the tissues, causing peripheral edema, ascites, hepatosplenomegaly, and all the symptoms of congestive heart failure. So this is the summary of the pathophysiology of restrictive cardiomyopathy. How does it manifest? As I've just explained, there is shortness of breath, uh, usually at rest and sometimes with ex exertion. There's also pulmonary edema, and uh, this pulmonary edema is usually because of the congestion of fluid inside the lungs. Now, the patient may also show signs of right-sided heart failure, as I just explained. So, there's going to be, you know, jugular venous distension with ascites, edema, and of course, the edema is uh, because of the leakage of fluid from the vessels into uh, the tissues and the weight gain is obviously because of the edema. Then there's going to be also uh, chest pain because little blood leaves the uh, left ventricle and so the coronary arteries also receive very little blood to perfuse the heart, hence the ischemic symptoms that we see in chest um, in. Uh, angina or in chest pain. Now there's also lightheadedness or fainting in these patients. The patients uh, are also at greater risk of developing atrial fibrillation because uh, they may also develop uh, you know some form of uh, thromboembolism and the uh, atrial fibrillation is usually due to conduction abnormalities in these uh, patients. Now on Physical examination, what do we find? We find that, as I've explained, there will be jugular venous you know, distension. There is going to be also systolic murmur from you know, uh, mitra as well as the tricuspid uh, you know, regurgitation. Then also there will be wheezing and rails uh, on auscultation as well as S3 heart sounds will be heard. So how do we investigate restrictive cardiomyopathy. The first line of investigation is the use of echocardiography. And I hope by now you've seen that the first line of investigation in almost all the echocardiography is, uh, in almost all the cardiomyopathy is echocardiography. So it is the first best diagnostic uh, to, to use. And what does it show? Echocardiography will show uh, a rapid ventricular filling time with uh, you know reduce or uh, rapid ventricular filling time with reduced diastolic you know uh, filling time and diastolic dysfunction with preserved systolic you know function is often the only echocardiographic abnormality that may be noted. We may also use the speckle and the speckle is going to show you know uh, decreased longitudinal strain, but normal circumferential strain and left ventricular torsion will be seen. And interestingly, we are going to find that ejection fraction may remain within normal limits until the disease progresses to impair the circumferential strain. That is the only time that we are going to find ejection fraction reducing. Now, we may also uh, use the ECG and though the changes are non-specific, it may point to uh, uh, decreased amplitude, it may show uh, atrial fibrillation, that's arrhythmias, and also some conduction abnormalities such as 
the left bundle uh, branch uh, block and all of these uh, are due to poor response of the heart muscles to electrical impulses then chest x-ray will also reveal signs of heart failure which uh, we've seen we've seen that chest x-ray signs of heart failure include the a b c d and e you can go back to the previous video and look at what these stands for but basically uh, we are going to find uh, the pulmonary congestion also the pleural effusion and all those uh, edema uh, you know shortness of breath on uh, or in this patient now we can also uh, do uh, blood analysis including the liver function test because we said there is going to be uh, hepatosplenomegaly we have to check the electrolytes as well as the cardiac enzymes to rule out certain causes of uh, cardiac disease such as you know the troponin and the CKMB to rule out ischemic heart diseases so basically uh, these are the first line investigations with the second line investigations what uh, we do is endomyocardial biopsy and endomyocardial biopsy is the gold standard in the diagnosing of restrictive cardiomyopathy it shows uh, the, the you know the kind of deposits in the myocardium be it amyloid plagues uh, sarcoidosis or even ion that's why we may go for endomyocardial biopsy. We can also use CT, MRI, and also uh, diagnostic angiography. And we use this particularly to distinguish you know, restrictive cardiomyopathy from other constrictive you know, uh, forms of heart disease, such as pericarditis. We do this because in constrictive pericarditis, the problem is with the pericardium and it is correctable with surgery that is why we have to employ these uh, methods so how then do we manage restrictive cardiomyopathy our aim is to manage and treat the underlying cause and also to offer some symptomatic treatment so with symptomatic treatment uh, what we can do is uh, we need to uh, initiate the use of uh, beta blockers and when we give beta blockers, we, 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 we give it in order to maintain a sinus rhythm and also to help increase the ejection fraction. And so we can give cavidolol. Then we can also give calcium channel blockers such as uh, verapamil to increase the diastolic filling time and decrease the sympathetic activity on the heart. Then we can also uh, initiate uh, ACE inhibitors, specifically you can give lisinopril like or diuretics, you can also give uh, furosemide. We give this to reduce the amount of fluid going into the heart at a time to reduce the workload of uh, the heart. But it is important for us to note that uh, we may not be able to give ACE inhibitors in amyloidosis. Now, we may uh, also do a uh, heart transplant in the later stages of the condition. So basically, this is how we manage, you know, restrictive cardiomyopathy. Now, how do we prevent complications? Complications uh, may arise from atrial fibrillation. And so we must uh, give anticoagulation such as warfarin to these patients. We have to give this unless it is contraindicated. This is because these patients stand the risk of developing thromboembolism. Now, uh, when we look at the prognosis of restrictive cardiomyopathy, uh, it is poor, especially for amyloidosis. Now, let's quickly end our uh, discussion by looking at some echocardiographic uh, you know, signs of restrictive cardiomyopathy in the image on the left in A, what we find is that uh, it shows the you know, uh, parasterna long axis view and as you can see a very reduced chamber of the left ventricle. So you can see it that there is a very reduced chamber of the left ventricle 
then when you look at the B, what we find, as you can see over here in the apex view. So the B is showing the four chamber view in the apical position. And as you can see, there is a stiff ventricular wall with very reduced cavity. So you can see it over here. You can compare this cavity to this cavity and you can see that it is very much reduced. And the septum is mildly enlarged and, uh, you know, a dilated right atrium can also be seen. So you can see that the septum is mildly enlarged over here. Now, let's look at uh, this one too. So uh, on this um, echocardiography, you can see that the chamber over here is reduced as compared to this side because of restriction. And you can see that the atrium over here is also very much enlarged. The same way you can see the restrictions over here in the B uh, slide. Now, let's look at the ECG signs of restrictive uh, cardiomyopathy. On this ECG, um, uh, this ECG is showing uh, a patient with amyloid infiltration uh, of the heart. And uh, you, you should note the low voltage in the precordial lights. You can see, look at the precordial lights, very low voltage. It means they cannot, you know, impulses cannot pass through them and they cannot expand or they find it very difficult to relax. So you can see uh, the voltages over here are so low in V5 as well as in uh, V6 in the uh, so that is it. And you can also see that there is a prolonged PR interval of about 120, or of about 20 uh, milliseconds, sorry. So you can see a prolonged PR interval of uh, 20 milliseconds. On this, on this ECG, what we can find uh, is that this ECG is also uh, showing uh, some reduced, you know, voltages. As you can see, look at V2. And look at V3. Mm -hmm. So it is actually showing atrial fibrillation and decreased amplitude. So everything is reduced over here. So you can see everything is reduced. The voltages are all reduced. And uh, it is also showing uh, left bundle branch uh, block. So these are some of the ECG signs of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And I think um, uh, this is all that I have for you on restrictive cardiomyopathy. Uh, thank you very much for your attention.